War, famine, or natural disaster strike and people flee. Suddenly, they are refugees seeking safety. But with the number of people in that situation today topping 60 million, it's raising questions about whether the usual solutions, camps, migration, resettlement, whether they're adequate for the task any longer. Joining us now to consider how we might reimagine asylum. From Oxford, UK, via Skype, Robin Cohen. He's Emeritus Professor of Development Studies at the University of Oxford. In Portland, Oregon, Jason Boozy, founder of Refugee Nation. And in studio here, Christina clark Kazak, Director of the Center for Refugee Studies at York University. Delighted to welcome the three of you to our program tonight. Let's start by just putting a few facts on the record here to bring our viewers up to scratch on what's going on. There are currently, as we suggested, 60 million displaced people in the world today. More than 15 million are refugees, as defined by the UNHCR. Over 10 million have been in limbo for at least five years, meaning their rights and economic, social, and psychological needs remain unfulfilled. Their average length of stay in exile without returning home is nearly 20 years. Some more facts here. Developing regions host 86% of the world's refugees, while Sub-Saharan Africa hosts 4.1 million refugees, Asia and the Pacific, 3.8 million, Europe, 3.5 million, the Middle East and North Africa, 3 million, and the Americas, about three quarters of a million. Fewer than 1% of refugees are submitted for resettlement. In the year 2014, only 126,000 plus refugees returned to their countries of origin. All of which begs the question, Robin, is the current system of settling refugees, in your view, broken? Broken may be too strong a word for it, but it's certainly under a huge crisis, and we haven't really seen the scale of this crisis since the end of the Second World War. There are just simply now so many people in precarious situations that I believe, as you suggested in your opening remarks, that we need to look at some new solutions and some new ideas. We shall look at those as we continue our conversation over the next half hour. Christina, I want to go to you next because you worked in a refugee camp in Uganda, is that right? Yes. Okay. Do, you, do refugees become citizens of the country that they take up asylum in? It, usually not. Um, so for the majority of refugees who are in developing countries, it's easy to get refugee status, but it's very difficult to get citizenship, if not impossible. So what kind of rights do they have in the countries in which they are seeking asylum? They have rights under the UN Convention on Refugees. So they have rights to education, they have rights to health, they have rights to food, um, etc. But these are rights that are on paper. They don't necessarily are able to exercise these rights in practice on the ground. Do we, Robin, treat these refugees too much like victims depending on humanitarian assistance rather than acknowledging that they can be kind of contributing, if not citizens, then at least people to the country in which they find themselves? That's definitely the issue. Um, we've been historically used to the idea that we should offer temporary, temporary protection, temporary housing, pending resettlement in a third country or in their countries of origin. And as your initial figures indicated, that simply isn't happening on any significant scale. So we now have to see refugees as agents in constructing a new life in the places that they happen to wash up in. Jason Boozy is uh, also with us tonight, of course, and he has put on the table for consideration an idea that is controversial and is getting a lot of people discussing. Let's just take a look at the bullet points of this, and then Jason will ask you a few questions about it. Uh, he's calling for a refugee nation. He is calling for a sovereign nation where every refugee would be automatically granted citizenship. Entry, of course, would be voluntary. This country would be democratic, pluralistic, capitalistic. Potential locations could include uninhabited islands in the Philippines, where there are 7,000 islands, or Indonesia, where there are 17,000 islands, uninhabited land in Finland, or sparsely populated countries like Dominica or Micronesia. Funding would likely come from billionaires, the United Nations, non-governmental organizations, corporations, possibly investors, and English would be the official language. Jason, let's just sort of explore where you got this idea from in the first place. How did it come to you? Well, I myself was born in Israel, which was a country that was established for Jews from all over the world. Many of them uh, were refugees at the time and didn't have anywhere to go. And, you know, it was a wonderful thing for people who didn't have a home. 
My father's family was uh, basically forced out of Iraq, which is what's happening now to Christians and Yazidis and even some Muslims in the same region. And they had a country to absorb them in Israel where they initially lived in tents and then were given permanent housing. It also comes from my background growing up in California, which I came to at age 12 and uh, in a very multicultural, diverse place where we had Vietnamese people, Chinese, Korean, Mexican, Indian, uh, Russian, everybody living together harmoniously. So to me it's sort of a combination of both the refugee background of my own family and living in a very multicultural part of the world saying why can't people come from all over and get along and have a place where refugees are welcomed, are given full citizenship, full rights, and can participate in the democracy and can have the opportunity to work, can have the opportunity to uh, send their children to school. You know, there are camps now, for example, in Kenya where there's millions of Somali refugees and they can't even get an education for their children, they can't work, they're not even allowed to leave the camp. And that's a situation that's happening in many parts of the world. So we need some kind of radical solution. The status quo is no longer acceptable. You're a successful real estate investor in California, Silicon Valley in particular. Have you put some of your own money behind this idea? I've put some of my own money, but you know, between 50 to 100,000 that I've put into just sort of uh, get you know, some media attention, PR, and promote the idea. But the amount that's actually needed to implement it is going to be in the billions. So I'm talking to different people now and we're trying to organize a conference to figure out how to make that a reality. What makes it's you think have the, to be either governmental. I'm sorry, what makes you think that there is, uh, in addition to yourself, others who are interested in pursuing this idea? Well, you know, shortly after I came out with my proposal, this uh, topic which was barely discussed here in North America started getting a lot of attention because of what's happening in Europe. The conflict uh, with refugees coming into Europe and the sort of polarizing reaction that that's created. So now, you know, in Europe they're spending billions of dollars to tell Turkey, to give Turkey to keep the refugees that are coming mostly from Syria from getting over to Europe because they're saying we can't ha handle anymore the migration crisis, the refugee crisis is just overwhelming some European countries and there's a lot of public debate about what to do about that. So this was, you know, an issue that's been ignored for very long and now that it's basically affecting Europe and probably going to start affecting North America more, it's getting more discussion and the time is really ripe to start talking about radical solutions. There's no question it's timely. I, I wonder, Robin Cohen, whether you could tell us if there's any precedent for this idea. Well, historically, there are weak precedents. They're not exact. But I turn to the period immediately after the First World War, when then, as now, there were large numbers of unsettled uh, populations, groups, swirling around, particularly Europe, and a nation-state system that was not quite ready or had been broken by the First World War and was not able easily to put separate population groups into a, an existing nation state. So the, UN, the League of Nations, uh, the predecessor organization to the UN, did set up mandates in significant number of countries, over 20 countries all over the world. They are protected territories, sometimes they are called um, havens, but they have some degree of uh, interest because with some modifications we could t look at these historical precedents and see whether any of them would work for our current purposes. Christina, what do you think of the idea? Um, I think that it is time to think about creative ideas. I'm not sure whether this particular idea is going to solve some of the structural issues. Um, the fact that we have um, very rich countries who do not want to help out and the poor countries um, shouldering the burden of, of hosting refugees. Um, I think there's also an issue about whether or not refugees want to um, go to another country and settle there. So um, if we take the example of Canadian resettlement of Syrians, um, when the Canadian government first offered permanent resettlement to Canada where we, they would come in as permanent residents and become citizens, in fact, uh, there was little uptake at the beginning and that's what um, made it actually quite difficult at the beginning to, to fulfill the promise of bringing 25,000. So we have to be careful about this idea that um, 
you know, just offer, offering one other opportunity is necessarily going to be the opportunity that everyone is looking for. Sure, but as you look at the globe right now, you wanted to sort of throw a dart at the map somewhere? You got an idea of where this could happen, where it would make sense to happen? I, I mean, I think that is a very interesting question because there are very few areas where there's not some kind of claim over territory, either by Indigenous groups or by other groups who are already living there. So even in very scarcely populated areas, there are still people living there. So if we take the example of Chakachu refugee camp where I, I worked and lived um, for a period of time, um, it was perceived to be a, an area where there was no one living, but in fact there were a hundred families in that area who were then displaced by creating a refugee camp in that area. So I do think we have to be careful about um, thinking about places as being open to settlement and this sort of neo-colonial idea of creating new territory within existing spaces. Robin Cohen, you told us there is some precedent, I, th I think the word you used was weak, weak precedent for this idea, but you didn't tell us whether you liked the idea. What's your thoughts about well, it? I, I like the idea, but of course Christina has put her finger on exactly the key problem, which is to say any new state, any new territory that one establishes, whether as a mandated territory or a protectorate, does have the real problem of what relationship is that territory going to have to the existing people. So without displacing new Oh, the old population, is it possible to persuade a group of people, perhaps with financial incentives, perhaps with economic opportunities, to admit a whole lot of new people into their midst uh, in a new political order? It's a pretty big ask, but I think it's worth making that ask. What about, for example, I mean, I presume it would be easier to do in places where people don't have to travel halfway around the world, so, I mean, East Libya is a pretty disorganized place these days. Is that a, a potential solution? That is a, a potential solution, and it's, it's almost paradoxical insofar as Lib Libya is in such a terrible state, three governments, no, none recognizing each other fully, about seven major terrorist groups of the order of Al-Qaeda, perhaps over four to five hundred uh, militia. There is simply no effective law and order, no security for the people who are already there. And so it may be possible to persuade people to trade, if you like, a somewhat fictive sovereignty, a somewhat fictive polity that they already have for some degree of security in a new order. Eastern Libya is at least close to the zones of conflict. It is possible technically. There were larger populations there. There are unused um, areas around uh, Tobruk. There are two um, quite big desalination plants. So there are some practical reasons why that could work. Jason, there aren't too many places in this world, we like to think that Canada is one of them, where people from all over the world, many different kind of ethnicities, religions, backgrounds, and so on, can all live together relatively harmoniously. And you're talking about potentially creating a new country where some potentially very broken down, damaged people with tremendous psychological problems, they've come from horrible situations, presumably are supposed to get along harmoniously in this new place. Is it too big an ask in your view? No, I think they want to put their past behind them and start a new life. And, you know, just like people from Vietnam came here to the U.S. and to Canada in the 1970s after the war and like people fleeing Syria are coming now, most people just want to start a new life, put it behind them. They're happy to be in a multi multicultural society. There's actually quite a few examples um, in the world. Singapore is another great one. You have the Malays, who are Muslim for the most part. You have Chinese Singaporeans. Uh, I don't know if they're Buddhists or Christian, some of them. And then you have a lot of people of Indian descent who are both Hindu and Muslim. And I've been to Singapore. It's the wealthiest country in Southeast Asia. Very functioning democracy. That be, you, you probably also, you mentioned Australia a second ago, you probably heard the comment from the former advisor to Australia's Council on Asylum Seekers and Detention, who equated your idea to the equivalent of uh, creating a leper colony. What's your reaction to that? I think he's totally misunderstanding my proposal, or unless he's intentionally uh, distorting my proposal. I'm talking about everybody having full and equal rights, complete freedom, it's voluntary. You know, le lepers are kept somewhere, they're not allowed to leave. 
This is saying, okay, you're in a refugee camp now, whether it's in Jordan or Turkey or Pakistan or Kenya or wherever, and do you want to go to a country where you will have the opportunity to work, where your children can go to school, where you'll be an equal citizen to everybody else, and giving them that option. Robin, let me get, uh, bring you back into the discussion here and ask you about an idea that you and your colleagues are promoting called Refugee at 2035. What's that about? Well, this is a slight... Um, de we, we depart from Jason's proposal in that we think the um, solution may not involve necessarily a particular con concrete territory. Rather, we're now trying to think as we're truly out of the box and say, well, perhaps there's something we can develop which is a post-national citizenship, which is not particularly attached to a nation state or a particular territory, but nonetheless allows people to have certain rights. So this could, you can imagine, for example, people in existing refugee camps joining a concept of refugee where they would have certain entitlements, uh, for example, educational entitlements, where they would be able to vote in a transnational uh, election, um, where they would be able to move freely between different elements of refugee, different camps or different segments or different territories or territories that were leased to refugee under the control of sovereign territories. So, in fact, it's a, a very broad and rather complex idea. It will take a little bit of exposition, but the idea is to think beyond the nation state, rather because, e essentially, the problem has escaped the nation state. Hmm. Christina, what do you think of that idea? Um, I definitely think that I agree that the problem has escaped the nation state, and I agree that we need creative thinking. What I'm a bit concerned with both of these proposals is that they go uh, too much a bit beyond the current system, and in a way they give um, the, the current states a bit of an opportunity to not fulfill their right, uh, the, their obligation the to the, the right to asylum. And so what I'm concerned about is that um, with these proposals, um, nation states such as Canada and those in Europe are, who are already turning around way lots of refugees will basically say, well, we have other options here, and so therefore we do not actually need to admit refugees onto our territory. Are we at a point in world history right now where things are so desperate we've got to really entertain some very out-of-the-box ideas. I do think we need to entertain out-of-the-box ideas, but I do think we need to do it in a measured way, and we can't let the current system collapse while we're focusing attention on the other, other solutions. Robin, let me do a bit of a Q&A with you right now on some ideas uh, related to your Refugee 2035. For example, a Sesame card. What's a Sesame card? Well, the word sesame, of course, means openness, and it's, it signifies that on this card, which would be like a smart passport, you would be able to load all sorts of entitlements. So it sits together with the Refugee 35 idea. So let's supposing um, Bill Gates was interested in malaria protection for those people, Somalis in Kenya, that we've alluded to. He could load all their cards with an entitlement to get a mosquito net, but the card could also have all sorts of other functions. For example, it could be a, an international labor market, a match. So somebody could load their CVs on and a Brazilian government um, official could say, oh, we need a Syrian dentist in Amazonia. Let's fish this guy out of the refugee camp and then load onto his cards the means of travel to um, Rio de Janeiro. So the idea of a Sesame card is to create a kind of flexible passport that can be used internationally to try and disperse um, refugees, to try and match their needs to uh, places and peoples that would want to have them. Hmm. And let me follow up with this. Uh, we know that many of the refugees, as they wait for their status to be determined, are living in you know, truly appalling conditions. Yeah. I have, uh, we're, well, let's show these. We're going to show some pictures of something called an IKEA flat pack shelter. Why don't you describe what that is for us? Well, this is one example. One shouldn't be too, uh, you know, praising of IKEA alone because there are lots of other examples uh, on, on show. But it's the beginning of an idea that says, forget about those terrible tents, which are not secure, 
often the, the um, refugees are Muslims concerned about safety and security of their women. People have possessions and so on. You want to be able to lock um, such a, a place. This ha you can't see it in the illustration, but you could, this has um, uh, uh, solar panels. It has a USB port. It begins to connect people to the world and it can also be augmented so people can put cladding brick cladding or timber cladding on the outside and begin to create for themselves a life that is better than a terrible tent. Okay, in our remaining couple of minutes here, Jason, let me ask you, in your view, what do you think immediately needs to happen next in order for your refugee nation uh, idea to go forward? Well, we're trying to organize a conference right now. I met with some Swiss business people and we're talking about organizing a conference and bringing people together with uh, alternative ideas and solutions. I'm hoping that uh, Professor Cohen maybe can join us and uh, other like-minded academics and people that are interested in solving the problems. What's clear is that the status quo is not working. And because it's not working and because we're in a world that's more and more connected, people can see how those in Europe in America live because they have access not just to television but the internet. In fact, they probably think we live, most of us, better than we really do. And that's why millions of them right now are risking their lives. European cities feel overwhelmed. I mean, this is an urgent crisis that we have to solve. And unless we put forward some radical solutions and start implementing them, nothing will change. It will just keep getting worse and worse. But as far as what needs to happen for the refugee nation, it needs to be taken seriously by governments, by NGOs, and we're going to try to have the summit to forward the discussion of it. Christina, you work at the Center for Refugee Studies at York. You have our attention. Uh, this is the issue that has animated your professional life, and the world is now paying attention to it. What's the next thing we have to do to improve this? Um, I think there has to be international leadership um, of the UN agency, but also of the various governments involved. Um, I think that we do need to try to fix the broken system as well as try to find alternative solutions. I would also say that in all these discussions, we need to have much more closer consultation with refugees themselves. They have very creative solutions that they're implementing on a daily basis in these very difficult circumstances, and I don't think that enough attention is paid to those creative solutions that are already happening on the ground, um, and that a lot of the attention and the money is being paid to these more grandiose, if I could um, say that, um, ideas. I want to thank all three of you for joining us on TVO tonight and uh, helping us explore these interesting and new ideas about the refugee crisis in the world today. Jason Boozy, the founder of Refugee Nation, on the line from Portland, Oregon. Robin Cohen, the Emeritus Professor of Development Studies at the University of Oxford, where he joined us via Skype. Christina clark Kazak, Director of the Center for Refugee Studies at York University. Many thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit TVO.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.